Hey guys, Asteria here. Just letting you know that unfortunately the after chapter discussion for the Wandering Inns chapter 8.66 was eaten by the recording robot, so it'll forever live on in Craig's stomach. But we do have a summary that was put together by Action Kermit that's been read aloud by Gunman Dude, so enjoy! Pirate says that the end of Volume 8 is a volume in itself. They're tired after Hectfall, and the Sitar interlude gives them a break. But they've burned through their fresh energy and have to use the stale energy. The chat suggests Pirate burn all of their fresh energy on Warhammer. And Pirate says, How dare you imply I was bored of fighting siege battles and came here to write. Litwicky asks if Pirate would prefer that they outright state it. It's an experimental chapter with vague ideas, and Pirate won't try hard unless they do. Back to the newt. Chieftain Mrel of the Demis Metal Tribe is still looking at the homeless guy in the vision of the Earth from the World of You and Me skill. Proof that even societies with advanced technologies can still be built in flawed ways. Mrel gives the homeless guy all his money, and then he disappears. Meanwhile, a debtor, in classic fashion, manages to take out half a police station until the cops bring him down. He claimed it was to see how good the average guard was. The chat is not mad, just disappointed. The first casualties were Chieftain Giroux and Chieftain Ulskrzyk of Plains Eye, who opened the emergency door on a plane. Morel doesn't understand a world where you can create a giant box of moving steel, but you can't give a man a purpose. And he hates his haircut. He tries to get a job at a McDonald's, where the ice cream machine works, which breaks the suspension of disbelief. A debtor got bounced from the simulation again for starting a fistfight. The World of You and Me skill continues to be mad-based. A debtor tries to fight his way back into the skill, and he gets bonked on the head by Thiekha. A debtor is annoyed that he can't really fight in this situation until he discovers the joy of cars and randomly driving into things. That's it. GTA has come to Inworld. A lot of Knolls couldn't handle the, so the sudden shock of being in a completely different environment. Cetrul discovers the time-stealing horror that is an arcade. Chat is skeptical that Disney World is a real place. Meanwhile, Sitar Silverfang has been thrust into instant stardom. Books from around the world begin to arrive, and she's been meeting chieftains and book lovers who want to see the cool new stuff. But she's also feeling overwhelmed by the sudden change. Sitar is doing an unboxing stream for Wistrom. The book is Anthologies of Celt, Volume 1, blah blah, yada yada. Fedoweb teleported it directly to Zeris and had a courier provide next day delivery. Pirate gets Quera's full name right on the first try, and the chat goes wild. Mercia is getting too full of herself, a truly ominous way to start a scene. She is disappointed that Lionette, despite being a princess, does not actually have blue blood. Which is fair. Mercia has appro appropriated the Sunglasses of Doom from Yelron, and is using them to blind people indiscriminately. Bielmark fortunately knows just how to deal with her, and takes the glasses for being a public nuisance. Bielmark has also taken custody of Mercia's Meshed Scroll, a prudent decision especially since Fedohep asked her to do it. Mercia throwing a tantrum inadvertently tells Quera about Earth. Quera instantly tries to strike a deal, which is a bad idea. Probably. Jerry comes swooping in and tells Mercia that she beat every single game, a fact that will do nothing for Mercia's mood. Jerry carries off Mercia in a chatty storm, and Rose decides that trusting the Silver Fangs is for the best. Meanwhile, Chieftains are extracting as much as they possibly can from the simulation. Chieftain Minyak of Sutfer is the sort of person Ryoka has nightmares about. Along with Yelrone, they're a part of a group dedicated to min-maxing the opportunities here. Miniak argues that anything they can be made can be stolen, so they're not going to try to reproduce armaments. Yelrone is a theory induced is in a theory-induced rapturous fugue state. At least one of the chieftains is stuck in a TV tropes rabbit hole, probably. Yelrone sees vast academic potential here, and is raiding universities for theories that they can apply. Pirate's computer is then making weird noises because of a cable brushing a fan. Opening it up to fix the problem is a pain. Then they lose power. 
When they start back up, Chief Jin Morel ruminates about Mersha and complains that he was sent down the wrong path by their shaman when Mersha was born mute because the dude was a plains eye, proving that plains eyes have been jerks to Mersha since the day she was born. Chief Jin Minyak sits around wishing that they had a Tenusin smith like Nawala Shifra. They suddenly realize Drakes and Earthers because Otisli has coffee. But the meeting of tribes is coming to an end, and they're all too quickly running out of time. Sitar Silverfang takes center stage, and the chat is hype. We get to see her skills, one of which crucially allows her to restore missing pages of an account. Missing passages of an account, which would let her restore old lore that was lost when the retellings became incomplete. All the tribe's cubs are going to hate Sitar now because of her ink skill, meaning they now have to do more homework. The passage skill is definitely the strongest, though, because it has a comma, and punctuation brings power. Everyone fears the mighty editor. Meanwhile, Fedoheb's book is every bit as extra as one could hope for, containing 30,000 pages of Celt's pure and magnificent glory. It even contains a magical table of contents and glossary, which is just as based as her eternal majesty, Celta I herself. The Meeting of Tribes used to take years to finish once upon a time, rather than the much-diminished meeting of today, which only takes years to write about. The volume contains a version of the Beast of Albez story, which is pretty much like the Silverfang one. Sitra tries to summarize it, but her narrative spot inconsistencies skill erases the parts that talk about how the White Knolls are bad. After much experimentation, it turns out that the Doombringer warned the tribe about the Beast of Albez, and they refused to listen to her, and that's why their tribe was destroyed. The chat continues to speculate about how much chaos Sitar could cause by upsetting the Blighted King's propaganda machine with the power of skill-assisted Madlibs. We get more cool lore dumps, and find out that Kelt was already tens of thousands of years old when Helta came to power, and that Kelt is old, so old that Salazar wasn't even a thing yet. Sure enough, the chieftain of Plainsai at the time was part of a pact with Salazar that was witnessed by Bellevier, called the Witch of Webs, during that age. Meanwhile, Bella is still sipping tea in a cafe with her massive hat, wondering why she doesn't blend in more. In a keen display of motherly intuition, Bellevier decides at some length that admitting murdered that admitting she murdered a lady of House L just to make a new undead daughter out of her corpse might unnerve Wiscaria for some reason. But who can say? Pirate complains that they don't want to do a timeline because they need to retcon shit. Which is the problem with web serials. They can't just pull a George R.R. R. Martin. Litwiki smugly suggests that if Pirate made their own timeline before they wrote shit, it would not be a problem. The Sass. Bellevier warns Maviola to stay away from Torin because he's a bad influence. She's still upset that after living for tens of thousands of years, she somehow managed to lose her eye to a frailing riding a bee, thereby reasserting Apista's rightful place as the best character in all of the Wandering Inn. Nears' contribution to Apista's glorious success was incidental. It turns out the Stitch Witch doesn't like being thwarted for some reason. She contemplates blowing up Scales and Tails, but is stopped mid-spell by Pirate getting a grocery delivery. The momentary pause causes her to consider alternate forms of vengeance. She dismisses the idea that she's some mass murderer or errant lawbreaker out of hand, even though she totes has a bunch of arrest warrants for exactly that reason. Chaldean finds out she's there, and decides the best way to run off the Stitch Witch is to give her something to do. Which is probably true, but definitely a cursed idea. Like a dummy, Chaldean sends her straight to the Meeting of Tribes. Meanwhile, at the Meeting of Tribes, Mersha the Well-Fed is creating a gastronomic scene that even Lehra Ruinstrider has to get on the action. Together, they nom wyvern steaks and terrorize a helpless fruit golem with Tkern and Inkar. The Thief of Clouds has to get his antihistamines because he's allergic to adventurers. Mersha is smugly bragging about her many connections, but the chat is stuck on the existential horror of the fruit golem thing. 
Yelron makes his dramatic appearance at the feast and single-handedly rescues the scene by discussing trigonometry with Jiri. Inkar and Takern are busy discussing cuteness and the reprobates. Some of the gnolls looked right at religious services, and their minds were clearly edited to keep them from understanding it. Everyone is having a grand time, and Zatrul just has to strut in and ruin it by announcing that there is some kind of mere emergency. The pettiness of drakes is why we can't have nice things. They're setting fire to all of the nice grass, which is suspiciously like what they did to River Farm a while back. The largest incoming drake army is 80,000 strong, which marks the startling appearance of the exact numbers in this conflict. Worst of all, the Ektouch decide to make Jiri fight, even though she's just a 14-year-old girl. Petty revenge for when Jiri got handsy, but it's another mark of being the long string of BS driving a wedge between Ektouch and their vaunted paragon. Lynette recommends mass-producing Yelron's glasses to blind the enemy with science, and Panzer suggests that you don't need glasses just to flash people. A debtor explains why fighting is unnecessary, and Rose tries to give him a favor, but doesn't find anything suitable. Mercia kicks up a storm, but isn't able to stop Jiri from marching off. But then suddenly Ferris is there, indicating that the dragons may not be far behind. Wallord Ilvris is leaving Salazar, but Lionette needs to find her own way out. Everyone has their dander up, and shit is hitting the fan. The one ray of sunshine that Salamani and C have taken Salas's antidote for, for Aaron north to Lysor yesterday. Zerus remains the worst walled city. There is suspicion that Magnolia's pink carriage is heading for Lysor as well. Pirate is zooming, and also snacks are important. Tension is hype. Three chapters in one is giving o Oshi ulcers. Meanwhile, two days ago, Lionette is watching TV with Siri and Rafe. Lionette explains about the time Aaron saw a dragon and no one believed her. But she really saw a dragon, so yay. Tyriarch, protector of lore drops, starfire dragon lord of pog monologues. Siri thinks dragons who live in caves are terribly stereotypical, even though Tyriarch does in fact have a cave, like a boss. Rafe is worried that Terry could be an evil dragon, but we all know that Terry is an even bigger goober than Jiri, which takes some doing. Lionette's daring mischief maker clearly organized Sitar's bigger event, which makes Lionette so proud, and also Mercia is grounded forever. Lionette reveals that Tyriarch is a dragon lord, and has a book about it by a Knoll of Plains Eye, which is interesting. And whatever Rafe does, she should stay away from any goblins who could point her to Tyriarch's cave, no problem. Flashback over, adults are the worst. Brave children should do everything except eat themselves sick with too much candy. Meanwhile, Chieftain Jiru of Plains Eye is busy being even more than worst of most adults. His tribe stands on a great foundation of tradition and history. But ancestors forbid you to examine tradition or history because otherwise you'll realize Jiru's power rests on a long historical tradition of being the worst. He decides to pay a surprise visit to the Silverfang tribal camp because hard times called for hard men making hard decisions while hard or something. I don't know, I'm not a chieftain. Anywho, he comes up with some sinister plan to sacrifice to Kern's life to save one of the gnolls that Jiru thinks is actually important, probably. Jiro wonders where it all went wrong, and the chat is pretty sure it was with the persecution of innocent people. Meanwhile, Silverfang is going to war, and Bielmark is too shook by the idea of guardsmen reading the rules to stop Tkern from marching, in ar marching with the army. Chieftain Morel of the Demis Metal Tribe shows up to give the Silverfang's armor made from his famous metal, which retains elemental energy well, and could possibly hold magic fire from Mersha the Ember Bearer. Mersha agrees to go with Morel for a while, to give him one more chance. But Noka of the Raskagar watch from the shadows. They prepare to ambush the meeting of tribes in hopes of finding important gnolls to eat and further their gifts. Yelron is trying to apply math and stats to military strategy with his newfound earth knowledge and reflects on matters of good and evil. Suddenly Marish appears and they get into a fight. But everyone wants Marish to fight the Raskagar. Even though Plains Eye, as a rule, is not in the business of being actually useful. 
Marish is still convinced that his people were killed by the Titan. More fighting. Then Shaman Okrizyk creeps around, and they cut it out. But Yelrone shows that his heart is still based, even if his fists are very cringe. Delta posts a lovely picture of Aaron playing chess, and the chat immediately photoshops six crossbow bolts into the picture. Delta loudly wonders how to block everyone. The chat commiserates with the future Andy when she has to figure out how to say Asmuzare one day. Pirate runs out for a snack to the sounds of weeping fat ducks who want their weird fix right now. Thank you. The snack break mercifully ends, and Mersha is walking along with Chieftain Moreau, mad at what he did wrong, and a little oblivious to the fact that she mis makes mistakes too. Rose needs to step up her game if she wants to be blessed with Mersha hand-holding duty. Mersha wants to make it clear that Morel can't buy Mersha's affection because he's too poor. She may need to be taken down a peg for the heinous crime of abandoning the bees in Lysor, who were counting on her supplies. The group meets with Shaman Theaka, and it turns out that Morel wanted to surprise Mersha by introducing her to the childhood bully who miraculously survived the Goblin Lord battle, but he is soon forced to flee by an impending knoll pile. The surviving young of the Stone Spears tribe were found by Zell Shivertail's forces and brought to the safety of the Gar Marsh tribe. Theaka says she listens to the wisdom of the Earth Elemental Cotiestro, which is simply unfair as far as names go. Some of the survivors blame Mercia, but other survivors blame Ryoka, which Ryoka would agree with because she takes the blame for the sun and the moon if she can get away with it. The chat is saddened by the sight of a playground with riots and no adults under siege from children. But then the children null pile on Chieftain Morel, which makes it sort of okay. Shaman Theaka sees a precocious and slightly too spoiled child, but not a horror of legend. But the Earth Elemental pays attention to Mercia, and it pays attention to few. Noka is on the prowl, looking for a way to grab Mercia. She gets harassed by an annoying merchant, who turns out to be Quera setting up an ambush. The Doomslayers led by Marish dispatch or capture the Raskigar, and Noka bitterly laments the fact that they couldn't get the White Knoll. Shaman Ulkrizyuk sees this as a great opportunity to act like a Raskigar himself, because why would a Knoll ever turn down that chance? And the chapter ends. The chat goes mad. Pirate cliffing. Much speculate. Wow. Totally poggers.